Street Library Association. Yep. And um, we went to number four, so the approval of minutes of both June 3rd and July 1st. Is there a motion to accept those minutes? Move approval. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Can we do a separate one? Oh, no, we don't need separate. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Um, looks like there's no public comment, so we'll move right to our report from fire and Okay, thank you. Um, I have some brief items, and then I'm going to ask Assistant Chief Nichols to, to go into some of our projections and, and where things are going to give uh, the committee a sense of that. Um, so, so first, and probably in many ways foremost, uh, this is the first time I can sit in front of you and say, we now have a contract that not only goes from three years behind, but goes forward. And in the 15 years I've been here, that has never occurred. So while, as the chief sitting as a representative of the city on the bargaining committee for the city, I'm sure there are some battle scars, this presents an opportunity that is not only an opportunity to provide sort of raises to our people, but to, to work together in a new way. And I'm looking forward to that and just wanted to sort of share that with you uh, going forward. Uh, another item is we have uh, the engine approved by the Capital Planning Committee that, that's been ordered. Uh, that is expected to arrive in late November, early December of this year, which is actually probably about three months ahead of schedule. Um, so as we're, we're going into sort of, uh, as I said when we presented this, an apparatus crisis that we have things breaking down almost on a daily basis. My mechanic's hair is almost turning gray over some of these, but uh, he's doing a great job and working uh, so a lot of extra hours to keep things in play. Uh, we did sell uh, our sort of oldest piece that is in the most disrepair, that's engine five. It was sold uh, through uh, a combination of posting it online and uh, bids. We received a bid of $45,000 for that. Uh, and we'll be approaching the council to sort of transfer that money for equipment. Typically what we do is we would trade that in toward the new vehicle. Um, under the bid where we actually were able to lock in prices from two years ago, we couldn't do that. So we had to sell it as surplus. Um, so, so that's what we did. And when that arrives, that will be leaving in November because what we don't want to do is go through the pump testing on that and put a new inspection sticker and a lot of money into it. So that will be leaving just before the new vehicle arrives. Um, and for, as far as that 45000 some of the, the items that uh, are sort of earmarked, mostly air packs. Uh, that as we purchase uh, new equipment, we tend to update them with air packs. I was shocked when we looked at what is the cost of an air pack today I can remember when they were about $2,500 a piece. Well, now they're about $6,000 a piece. Uh, so that, between that, spare bottles uh, and some batteries for our thermal imagers, that chews up that $45,000 without even looking at some of the other basics that need to go with the truck uh, in that way. Um, moving on, this is the last year of our, our SAFER grant. Um, so I've been working diligently with the mayor to uh, get through that. Uh, we were wondering at one point if we need to, without the override, consider doing a waiver, uh, which would allow us to go down in staffing level. Uh, with the override, obviously, we've decided not to do that. And that means that we actually have to hire two people. Um, but those four positions will sort of, the funding for those will go away at the end of June. Uh, and without additional money from the city, the department will go from 72 personnel to 68. I think that's uh, somewhat realistic looking at the, the, the override, the mayor's financial plan. Um, and to that end, while we have to hire people, we've hired them as what we call reserves. And then, uh, so they will start October 7th, and they're reserve firefighters. They will work on a full-time basis from October 7th to the end of June. And then they'll be available if we have someone out on injury or a long-term absence for something else that we could offer them the opportunity to come back and work that uh, shift. So, so those two people are uh, slated to start again October 7th. They'll be in training for a month and, and then going on to uh, our shifts. Um, since we last met, we had uh, one significant incident, uh, I believe in Councilor Murphy's ward, of uh, an 
another fire at Meadowbrook Apartments. A uh, couple of things of note with that. One, through the DA's office, we've been very supportive of juvenile fire center intervention. Uh, and the DA has now got a second grant, uh, which encompasses most of Western Mass, on trying to address that problem. Uh, with this fire, it was ignited by a six-year-old uh, playing with a lighter. And it resulted in a fire that spread from one apartment up into others. Uh, we had a two-minute response time, which is uh, exceptional. And it also resulted in our crews working extremely hard on an extremely hot day. I know I was just soaked to the bone just being there in, in command, standing out front. So our people really put forward a great effort, and they had a great stop that we were able to stop that fire. It was on the first floor, moved to the second floor, versus the last one. We had a fire on the second floor that moved into the attic before we even arrived. So sort of a tangible difference, and if you remember the two fires, there are some sort of decisive factors, but one being sort of despite all the, the conflict uh, of the past, our people have done a really good job, uh, especially in that fire. Uh, another note with emergency management uh, is just we're receiving a third round of grants uh, called the EMPG grants, Emergency Management Planning Grants. Uh, this year's will be used to buy generators for both fire and police. Um, so that's just a quick update on grants. And, and grants are sort of drying up. Uh, Deputy Norris has been sort of the, the person who's got the most grants of anyone I know of. Uh, and there aren't a lot of opportunities that we're seeing out there. Um, we have not received um, a safer grant to continue the one that's expiring. And as far as the Fire Act grant, the one we did receive is a regional training grant to train EMTs and paramedics. So that, that is a quick summary of some of the items that are going on. I'd like to turn it to Assistant Chief Nichols. Uh, I've asked him to give you sort of a personnel update and start to project where are we in terms of overtime and finance. Yeah, currently this fiscal year, um, certainly we've been you know in the city staff process gathering data and sharing that with the mayor and his staff. Uh, we're projecting that in this fiscal year at Y14, uh, our projections just for really July and really one week into August is we're about 10% higher than we were the last fiscal year. Uh, some of the drivers on that is we got two long-term people out on uh, IOD, uh, injured on duty. Uh, we've got one person out right now on a leave of absence, a medical leave of absence, uh, for at least four months uh, that we know of. Uh, we've had numerous people out on family medical leave, whether they're having a child or taking care of injury or uh, illnesses that they need to take care of. Uh, I got two people in the fire academy right now that uh, we need to get them through. Uh, the good news on that is is that the, the uh, state fire academy has been reduced from 12 weeks to nine. Uh, they revised their program as of July 1st. So it's a nine week program instead of 12 where they kind of condense things down and uh, are running smaller classes to get people through that. So that will help us out uh, instead of sending them away for really three or four months, uh, for actually four months. Uh, one member out on administrative leave for a month, uh, and, and then we've had one vacancy where a member left uh, back in March that is kind of a uh, driver out through there. And then we had another member leave in August, uh, and we're seeing the effects of that. But where the chief mentioned, we'll be hiring two for October. Those will fill those two vacancies and hopefully catch us up. Uh, but I'll, I'll pass around uh, kind of the uh, slide that we had for city staff. We'll show you the three-year projections for overtime. Uh, and just with that, Chief and I are really concerned about going into this year and really keeping an eye on the overtime with all those factors out there uh, and trying to stay ahead of it. Uh, I've done some moves of moving personnel from shifts uh, to level them out to try to contain the overtime so that we're trying to manage it as best we can and to stay on top of it. But really just wanted to set the stage that we're trying to manage it as best we can uh, with the personnel we got and the people out on leave. Uh, but we're just looking I think for fire prevention, the, the notable thing is we're seeing an uptick in development, uh, which is a good thing for the city overall, but uh, we're having a lot of our services consumed in new construction, which hasn't been that way for the past five years or so. so uh, yeah, 
fire prevention, the, the, a lot of the construction that we're seeing is, is really renovations. Uh, I've seen single family homes go up, uh, but uh, it's really smaller things. And we've had a few good projects going. Smith College, which typically has, uh, during the summertime, anywhere from three to six projects going, only had one this summer. And uh, so it, it's happening. I, I think there is some rebuilding of. So, and as Assistant Chief Nichols said, uh, the, the slide before you is from the city staff process. Um, presently, we're meeting monthly with uh, the mayor and his staff to sort of review where we are. This is one aspect of that. There's others such as response times. We're actually developing a report card for what, what are the things that would be really important to members of the public, such as what's the level of training of firefighters, what's the level of public education in the community, uh, what are the response time, what are the incident numbers, and, and we've come up with a system of sort of then grading the department on a monthly basis and a quarterly basis. So we're, we're rolling that out, uh, and again, this one really looks at just the overtime, so we've dissected it even further to look at some of those drivers per hour and per employee and so forth. Um, about 85% of the drivers are really beyond our control, they're contractual, um, and there's about 15% that it's training and, and other things that we have some control over. Um, so that's one of the things that's really become apparent, and I know I think I've said it here before, of when we have injuries and so forth, if we're gonna fill and provide a level of service, there really isn't that level of control because of the contractual obligation. So, so that's sort of fire and uh, operations, fire prevention. I'd pause here for any questions and turn it over to EMS. that process been helpful uh, as far as management techniques go, or is it, uh, is it just talking apples and oranges, or what? I think it's it's been helpful and it's been educational for some of the things that, that we talk about on a regular basis and understand. I'm not sure everyone understood the same thing, so in terms of apples and oranges, I think now we're talking more apples and people understand things a little better. And I think we're also starting to extract some value. We're looking at car seat installations and what's the value of that, what's the cost of that, things like that. And then the report card, I think, is something that Assistant Chief Nichols and I think is valuable to project to the public some of the data that has been there, but we've never really sort of harnessed it. So, uh, on the other side, I know some of our deputy chiefs are just shaking their head over some of this stuff. Too the need to capture data and some of the, what questions are we answering? Uh, and we're trying to, through our efforts with the data analysts, focus that into you know, some more valuable things. So we may not need to go into as much of the drivers of things as we need to look at the bigger picture. I think one of the, the things with it is the police have done this for years, uh, analyze data, and really, I think, have it down to what, what are they looking at? And when you mentioned apples and oranges, we're one of the first communities to really do the fire data. So it really is trying to, I think, determine what, what do you want to track and how do you want to track it and really move it forward. Uh, as the chief mentioned, the scorecard, uh, we kind of came up with that idea. It's a neat way, I think, to put on the website for as a quick snapshot if a citizen wanted to look at the department uh, to see the number of you know, fires we had during the month, uh, calls, response times, just things that may be important and, and are an easy way for someone if they really want to look at the I think we're narrowing down that focus, and uh, I think month by month we get it down to where do we want to look at and how do we want to look at it, and, and I think it's working pretty well. I think so, some of the issues we've had have been within the uh, computer-aided dispatch system that, as Dwayne said, law enforcement has done this for years, starting in New York uh, with uh, Commissioner Bratton, and it's integrated into some of the computer-aided dispatch system more on the law enforcement side to easily extract data than on the fire side. So we've do, been doing some manual things and we're actually working with uh, the analysts to try and get, and this is above my level, but DDF files, which are data dictionary files, export them into a separate spreadsheet to then try and mine the data a little bit easier than what we're currently doing. So uh, it's, 
taking a lot of time, but I think there's some benefit there as well. Other questions? Okay. Thank you. I'll turn it over to Deputy Norris on EMS. Just in terms of the overview first, um, what you'll see is I took a snapshot of the last quarter and basically in the upper right hand corner, have you, have you seen this in the past, we've done um, just over 1100 calls. Um, nothing really jumps out on this one when you look at some of the trends in previous years uh, typical in terms of the split between ALS and BLS this one's showing 50 percent 57 percent of the calls are ALS 43 percent of the BLS and then we're always anywhere between that 10 and 15 percent for our disposition of transport versus non-transport again every call that we get sent to we're not transporting all the people all the time um, on the second page for day, day of the week analysis, it's more flat than we typically see, uh, but you can see there's a little bump in Tuesdays and Tuesday, Thursday, Friday are kind of the, the, hot, the top three there for days a week. The third page shows you again the time of day analysis showing the peak call volume during the normal routine uh, workday hours. Um, again, just as a reminder, we do have that impact shift between 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. where we have two additional people staff and an additional ambulance during those hours. And then the last page is the breakdown for your response times, um, showing you what percentage and comparative to minutes for those calls. So again, that's for the last quarter, June through the end of August. A um, couple other things going on. In terms of capital projects, through the City Capital Improvements Committee, um, we have completed the specifications and contracts for the new ambulance that has been ordered. Um, we're expecting a delivery of around Thanksgiving for that. Um, I've given you obviously the handouts as to what that's going to look like. That's already been forwarded to the state just to get their preliminary approval for uh, colors, paint schemes, lettering, and lights, which it has been approved. We took a ride down to the manufacturing facility in New Jersey back a couple months ago, the ambulance committee, just to do um, the preliminary walkthrough, make sure the designs were being built properly and to specifications. So again, that's uh, tentatively going to be delivered around Thanksgiving. Um, the second capital uh, project that was approved through the City uh, Planning Committee was the ambulance power loading system. That's one of the other handouts I gave you. The whole purpose behind this, again, we've really tried to focus over the years of uh, injury prevention. And two years ago, we were awarded a $55,000 grant to purchase uh, five brand new hydraulic stretchers. So it got rid of the old manual personnel had to lift those on their own. This power loading system, as you can see just on the front page of the handout I gave you, it basically closes the loop. So now when they get the person to the back of the ambulance, instead of having to push the stretcher up there, lift the stretcher up and push it in, um, it's almost like a set of forks that come out, grab the stretcher, pick it up, and pull it in and push it back out for you as needed. So that's what we really kind of looked at over the years, and this kind of closes that loop in the current uh, technology that's out there is we have the power stretchers and now we're doing the power loading system. The company is coming out Thursday to retrofit our current stretchers um, for this system. 
And then I got an email the end of last week. We're expecting delivery and install of these units on every ambulance the first week of October. The contract's already done, um, been signed up on by the mayor, and we're just waiting for delivery uh, of these units. So those are the uh, two capital projects, the current capital projects that uh, we're working on now. Um, just a couple other quick things. Um, back on April 1st, we instituted both engines out of the Florence and headquarters stations are now outfitted with paramedic gear. So in terms of state certification, you have the ambulances license. We now have both of our engines licensed at the paramedic level. Um, essentially, before, we were always staffing those engines with paramedics. They were responding to the same calls they respond to now, but we never had the ability to give them equipment they needed to do the job they were trained to do. So now both engines have that capability. Um, I guess, fortunately, we haven't had to use it that often yet which is good, but uh, on the other aspect of it, it's one of those situations where when you do need it, um, it's a, literally a life or death situation. Um, so they do have that capability. And then the other component for that is now on all the fire ground operations, if for any reason we don't have an ambulance on the scene of a fire ground, um, whether they've transported someone or have a delayed response, if something happens medically or traumatically to any of our personnel, we now have paramedic gear right there on scene to immediately treat them also. So that's up and running and moving forward. We've had, since we've done it in April, we've had a, a number of other communities come in and, and talk with us, most recently Amherst. Um, they actually instituted their engines at the paramedic level starting this past weekend. Um, so other communities are looking at it, they see the need. Um, just as we saw the need, West Springfield came and sat with us, Amherst, um, and East Hampton is thinking about it right now also. So it's one of those things that will slowly be coming full circle. Um, last thing I have, I mentioned about the power loading system, the new ambulance, you have handouts on both of those. We're also in the process of uh, trying to pre-plan in the future. Um, obviously, we're looking at uh, our capital plan, both on the fire and EMS side. And with that, um, we have our next, we have, we have five ambulances. Um, the one that we're taking delivery of in Thanksgiving, we're trading in our oldest unit, which is a 2000. When we look out at taking delivery of the next one, um, we're trying to figure out what is going to work best in terms of patient care and finances. And there's really two options. We can either look at developing specifications for a new one, or taking a current unit we have and taking the box in the back of that ambulance and having it remounted on a new cabin chassis. Um, when you look at the cost associated with each of those, a new ambulance now, um, the one that we got approved through Capital Planner was $235,000. Compared to remounts, depending on what you're doing with it, they can range anywhere from 120 to 150. So looking just to um, get some feedback from this group um, in terms of that, as we move forward, what your thoughts are on that process. The box still in good shape? The box is a 2007 box. It's had some wear and tear on it. Most notably is the rear doors. The hinges that run up the length of those rear doors have been bent. Um, our mechanic fix those, so they're operable now, but um, it's taken some dings over the years. I mean, they're, th these ambulances are doing 20, 25,000 miles a year on the front line. Um, over the course of the year, when it comes down to it, we're doing 5,000, 5,500 calls, responses a year. So um, they, they do take a beating, unfortunately, in the nature of the service we provide. And that unit will have over 100,000 on it, correct? Right, right now, that cabin chassis has over 90,000 miles on it. So probably when it's sort of cycled to be replaced, it would have about 120 to 130,000 miles on it. So that's in a few years, I think, a year or two. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it would, 
we're pretty well set up in ambulance rotation every other year, looking at the five ambulances in a 10-year cycle. Um, but we're, we're finding challenges with those. We're actually, in, with this ambulance, transitioning from a GMC chassis to an international chassis with the hope that, that it'll actually last a little bit longer. So, but it's a new chassis, we'll see. But boy, if, if you've got two cycles out of a box, that frees up close to 100000 for every changeover. That money can be spent other places, and if you could get two two cycles out of the box before you have to get rid of that, that would free up some money for other things. Does the new ambulance come with the with the power lift? Are they going to install it there, and we got have to retrofit it. We we purposely um, the chief put together an ambulance committee, and with that, um, really we we had the ability to build it from top to bottom, and really the only thing that we were given was this new unit is going to have this in it. Other than that, keep it to the state specification. So, so the new unit is going to come with that uh, power load system in it. The other thing with these power load systems, we're talking about a new ambulance. You can take these units out and put it in the ones that we're looking at. So are you going to put one in the 2000 or no. for a couple more you're not even No, so that one that we're getting traded in essentially Thanksgiving, a couple months. we're holding, that one it is not going to have one put in it. Um, the other four will have those put in it, uh, the first week of October, and the fifth new unit will have it when it backs in the doors at Northampton Fire. I agree with Councilor Murphy. It's possible to keep a box in and put on a new engine. I mean, that's the thing that takes the most wear, right, is the engine. And without without a doubt. Unless it has some sort of catastrophic damage to it or something, if it's just routine, but it'd be nice to be able to turn them over and save 100 grand a shot at least. So again, it's good to be spent somewhere else. But. Yeah, I think you made a good point too. Of it shouldn't be more than twice. No, then you start cycle it. Yeah, you the box itself. Well, and you want the guy, you don't want the guys to think we're being, you know, we'll be realistic. But right. if there there's another cycle's life in them, it's a shame to get rid of them and they're used to them. So pretty well, that, that would almost translate into where you do a remount followed by a new ambulance followed by a remount, mm -hmm. something like that in terms of capital strategy that over time would save you to a quarter million dollars. Okay, so what we'll take that as food for thought as we're putting <laughs> together the capital plan and, and that's exactly what we're looking for. The net, would you say that the new ambulance is a net of a quarter million dollars roughly or is it, because you, you trade in the old one or do you? Sell the old one? We, we traded in the new one, so the the value they placed on that two thousand was around eighty five hundred dollars. Don't don't hold me exactly to that. <laughs> okay. Um, but it was right around eighty five hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so then, the, really, the the cost to the city is two thirty five, two thirty something. Yeah. Yeah. They uh, appropriated was two thirty five. The, the okay, so really two forty five minus. Right, the 8500 won't go too far in even providing the radios that we're now required to have. So. <laughs> but boy, it does lead you to make me even happier to get another life cycle out of the box because uh, right. you're not getting that much for them. It's the utility of that box for another cycle, especially if it's in decent shape, is more than we'd ever get for it. Yeah. Right. And ambulances, they're just like a new car. The minute you drive it off the lot, <laughs> they depreciate right away. And then, just based on the service we provide, it just goes down from there. So you're not going to get much in resale of any handles at all. Right, so yeah, you can use the box then. One more time. Yeah. And, and we have had the experience that we had one chassis that actually caught on fire at CDH one night, and we did re-chassis that and have had fairly good success. Yeah, that was the 2005 uh, E450, um, which is our current A4. We re that with uh, GMC 4500 about three years ago now. Um, that was at a cost of about 110000 to remount that box. So it's about $100,000? Oh, it, it, absolutely. Like that, three years ago, it would have cost us close to 210000 for a new ambulance at that time as well. And capital improvements comes early this year. Right. And that, that's, that's why I like the whole thing cycled forward. So. 
Um, last thing I had on my list just to brief you on was um, annual state ambulance inspection. They actually called me Friday saying they're going to come this morning. Um, I got a text message from the state inspector at about 10 minutes of 8, having to cancel. He's going to reschedule. And he actually just called me about coming out the door down here. He's going to be here next Monday. Um, so just uh, next Monday is just the annual state inspection. They come through, go through, um, start to finish all of our equipment, supplies, the vehicles, lights, everything. So policies, procedures, certification, and personnel. Training records. So, so that I'll, uh, I will, won't have anything to report on that until uh, next time. But that will be next Monday. If you want a preview, then give me a call or shoot me an email and send out the results. That's all I had. So certainly, we take any questions? Any other questions? All right, well, thank well, you very much. Can I just say, I probably won't see you guys again, so uh, I hope, hopefully not in my professional life or private life. So or in their profession. Yeah, I worry more about yeah. their profession. So I want to thank you for the um, great information and, and, uh, and timely, timely, good information and, and uh, open uh, conversations that we've had. Okay. I also want to thank the department for the help of the jazz festival. You guys have always been very helpful. And we did have one incident there.